I want to invite you uh, this morning to what many of you will recognize both in-house and online immediately as a very well-known, I'm convinced, a very misapplied and abused scripture. It's a lengthy chapter which I do not have time to develop. I will take time at another time if the Lord provides and allows me the, the diligence to do so to preach the entire chapter, but obviously I'm not going to hold you here for 51 verses. I can assure you I could because I have a lot of things that I've written and I very rarely have any type of outlines. I do have some principles that I want to share with you today. They're just the overflow of my heart. I want you to go to what I would consider one of the scariest, for some reason, passages of Scripture in the Bible. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and while you're turning there, let me just preface what I want to say by saying this, and, uh, and, and there is, by the way, if, if some of you parents, I know we have long services and stuff, if some of you feel like you need to slip out, we, we, we have a whole area back here if you'd like to just kind of go into the hospitality tent, and kids can run around, it won't hurt us one bit, right, it's still under construction, but it's about done, so if you need to take your children in there, I promise you that won't be a problem, we can get some of our uh, staff or somebody to turn on one of those little air units that's back there, if you need to go back there with the youngins, we understand. But that being said, in Matthew chapter 24, it's a passage that has been on my heart for a long time. It's a passage that we preached on the last time I can remember under the red and white tent when our first book, This Means War, was produced. It was one of the chapters, but I, I preached it not in a different way, so to speak, but in a different context. And I am not one of these people that is always looking for signs for the return of the Lord, but I am one of those individuals that see the seasons for the return of the Lord. An evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and Jesus said, no sign shall be given you except the sign of the prophet Jonas that Jesus would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And the reason he said that would be the only prophetic sign to the return of Jesus is because if you cannot believe that Jesus is alive from a tomb, then you will not believe the rest of the prophetic overtones in the Bible. Does that make sense? So a lot of people say, well, Jesus said you shouldn't seek after signs, and y'all all the time talking about signs. No, there's a different signs of the times and seasons, and signs and miracles are different because at the end of the day, these signs shall follow them that believe. And if you believe the Bible and you're anointed by the Holy Spirit, you don't have to seek signs. Signs will follow you everywhere you go. And if miracles and power and presence and signs never follow you, you should take a hard look into the Word of God and see why that is the case. Because where there is the presence of the Holy Ghost, there will, shout will, be the power of the Holy Ghost. You're going to tell me God's going to walk into a room and just remain quiet and do nothing? Now, at the lack of being misunderstood, I've not got to the text yet, and we will. If a 600-pound man moved into your house, are you going to tell me that he can keep a secret and you don't know it? Well, you know, God walked into our church and we just had a normal service. You've lost your mind. Let a 600-pound man move into your downstairs or upstairs and see how long you can keep it a secret from your wife. Well, you know, God moved in, but he didn't drink none of the milk. God moved in, but he didn't make any footsteps. God moved in, but there was nothing that went bump in the night. When God moves in, I'm telling you, something's going to happen in the atmosphere, ladies and gentlemen. And we've so conditioned ourselves to nonsensical hour-long church services in the United States of America that we come to church expecting to get in and get out, not wanting God to move because we know when God moves, something's going to break loose. So in Matthew chapter 24, God's going to break loose. Now let me tell you what I'm not going to do today. I don't have time to develop. When, how, how, and where you believe about the specifics on the return of the Lord. I don't care. It's not a salvation issue. The rapture is not a salvation issue. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, it is not 
a salvation issue. Did you hear me? I used to make it a salvation issue. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The only thing I will say is this. I have a hard time believing the Bible has so much to say about a man named the Antichrist that apparently we're never supposed to meet. Everybody okay? Yeah. Prophecy, and I don't mean words of prophecy, I mean biblical timeline prophetically, has been so taken out of context that we have given people an escapist mentality. Has God called the church to be an army, yes or no? How many times have you ever seen a general train an army to retreat when the war breaks out? And we've been conditioned. God's raising up an army and just before hell busts loose, the army is going to retreat into the heavenlies. I am totally convinced that is utter biblical nonsense. I don't care if you clap or not. We, we've, we've thrown some other theology under the bus that we've messed with through the years, so we might as well mess with that one too. You see, there are some sacred cows I don't mind tipping over in the church house. So we'll find out, right? We'll find out. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue with people that are, you know, pre-trib rapture. It, if all of a sudden, if you believe in a pre-trib, and I did for a long, long time. If you believe in a pre-trib rapture, then look. When the trumpet sounds, I'll I'll knuckle bust you on the way up and say that was some good stuff you was involved in. But if somebody shows up in six months and says they're the ruler of now the one world government, you better give me a fist bump, put on a belt, and buckle up because hell's about to break out. You see, we've fussed for years over when is Jesus coming again, and the reality is it doesn't matter if you're not ready when he comes again. What difference does it make if you're not prepared? And so the purpose of the return of the Lord is to equip us to be ready. Not to equip us to sit around and fight and write books and pamphlets and tracts and get on the internet and get on Facebook like armchair theologians sitting in our mama's basement and fuss about when, where, and why. And absolutely, if you take this number and this number and you plus this and divide this and minus this and multiply this, and if you take this day and this day and two words out of Yahweh and two words out of Jesus or two letters, if you take this from Revelation, take it into Daniel, and then you do this and you have the seven feasts and the blah, 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 stop it! No man knows the day of the hour. And if you guess it, God will change it just for you. I've had to shut people down in our church about that nonsense. Getting my kids all started. Oh, Jesus going to come next week. Stop. Stop. Jesus going to come next week. That's ridiculous. Yeah, you ever notice that the people telling you, sell everything you have. Give me all your money. Jesus is coming next week. They ain't done nothing to prepare for Jesus coming next week. They just try to get you to see to make you prepare for Jesus coming next week. I don't know when he's coming. I don't care when he's coming. I don't care. I don't care. I just know he's coming. And when I read the whole 51 verses of Matthew chapter 24, it blows the socks off some of the theological dispositions that I've had through the years. I mean, it messes the whole thing up. The Bible has messed up a lot of what we call good preaching. I used to sit in service like this. Woo! That's good preaching. Go home, read the Bible, and be like, oh, that was kind of garbage. Right? And I preach some of that garbage. And I'm just telling you, I, I'm not going to theologically try to dance around issues in Matthew chapter 24 when it, I don't, it doesn't matter. If he comes today, if he comes in 100 years from now, the point is not when, the point is why. And the why is make sure you're ready because he's coming back for a spotless bride, not a trashy hooker. So I prayed a minute ago, so I, 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 I've already prayed. So I'm just going to jump in. I got a lot to say today. Some of you don't believe me, but I got a whole piece of paper up here. I'm going to show it to you. Because I, I, I never do this, okay? I never have this many points. I never have this many principles. And I'm still going to preach on the verses before I even get to the principles and may have to break this thing up and not even get it. But this morning in, in, in the office when I was studying, 
I already had a direction I was going to go, and the Lord said, oh, no, 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 son. We're going somewhere else in the house. So I, I, I normally break out a little piece like this, you know. Jot down two or three things. The Lord said, break out that big piece. I said, all right, let's break down the big piece. I, I didn't give it to them on the screens, and so it ain't going to pop up on the screen. So if you, if, you, if you need this later, you can come take a picture of it, all right? But I'm going to get as far as I can. I'm going to take my time. But I'm going to not belabor any of these points. All of them could be a series. Because I want to get to the text first. Because the text is way more important about than what I'm going to say from Greg Locke's principles. But Greg Locke's principles are going to come out of the text. But I need to read the text first. That makes sense? So I want to explain it. So help me, Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him. This is what we call the Olivet Discourse. Came to him. Watch this. Here's why they came. For to show him the buildings of the temple. Let me tell you something. God is not impressed with our buildings. These were disciples. These were followers of Jesus. And they said, hey, Jesus, come outside. We want to show you the building. We want to show you the stained glass. We want to show you the high-tech redneck screens and fog machines. We want to show you the steeple. We want to show you the beauty and the marble. We want to show you the wood and the tapestry. And let me tell you something. God's not impressed with our buildings. And he's going to, in so many words, tell them that. So the whole purpose was they thought they could impress God. Let me tell you something. What we pay bills with down here, God paves roads with up there. He's not impressed with your portfolio and your bank account. Expensive bicycles don't impress God. $50 million church buildings that are half full, wasting God's money that could be given to missions are not impressive to the kingdom. Y'all pardon me, I've been gone for a week, praise God. I got a lot of ocean water in me. I got to get out. I was watching this thing the other day. Look, I'm not against certain things at church. I like coffee as anybody, if not more than anybody in this room. Coffee is so biblical. There's a whole book called Hebrews, praise God. <laughs> but I was watching these people, and they like, you know, billboards. Come to our church. We have a first-class coffee shop. I'm like, come to our church. Our teenagers cast out demons in the name of Jesus. You can have your stupid Starbucks coffee shop up in your church. Your coffee shop ain't ever saved nobody from hell. My goodness, the church in America has lost its focus. Bring your friends to our church because we got a coffee shop. Who cares? Anybody ever got out of a wheelchair? Any cancer ever gone in the name of Jesus? Any homes ever put back together? Are the baptismal waters full of Christmas decoration? I don't care about your coffee shop. Now look, somebody wants to build a coffee shop here, pay for it, build a coffee shop. But I, I'm not going to get out there in the world and say, well, you know, we got everything that you can get over at Providence, so just come. Then why not just stay at Providence? I'm sick of the church trying to be so culturally relevant in America and then people get ticked off on Facebook and think I'm the angry one. You think I'm mad, you wait to the judgment seat of Christ when the wood, hay, and stubble gets burned up through the thrice holy eyes of a holy God with whom we have to... He don't give two flips of a wooden nickel about our stupid coffee shop. This building don't impress him. This HVAC don't impress him. Your car don't impress God. Your big house with a deep swimming pool does not impress God. I can't even hardly get out of the first verse. The disciples said, Lord, look how beautiful these buildings are. And Jesus like, la di da da I made the whole world in six days of creation and could have done it in six seconds. And you think this building is going to impress me? You can't impress God with your cute stuff. Church in America trying to be cute. Church around the world trying to be cute. Cute churches go nowhere for the kingdom. I'm trying to be cute. I'm trying to be right. I'm trying to be right. All right, we got to roll. we got a long way to go. Holy smokes. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? They're like, look how impressive this building is. He's like, let me tell you about this building. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He said, this whole thing is going to be laid waste. By the way, in A.D. 70, that's exactly when that took place. Anybody ever been to a Jewish wedding? Put your hand up. Anybody ever been to a Jewish wedding? Anybody? All right, there's a few of you. This passage's fulfillment is why the groom in a Jewish wedding takes a wine glass and sticks it under his heel and stomps it. 
It's the Jews remembering that in A.D. 70, the temple that was so gloriously impressive to them was not that impressive to God, and the enemy came in and tore the whole thing down to the frame. And by the way, the one that's going to have to be rebuilt for Jesus to return is already in the makings, in the process. It's already being set up. It's already in the goods. And I'm going to tell you something that's going to make half America ticked off mad right now. And I don't care because I'm feeling froggy and I'm about to jump. I'm just going to reserve myself. I do not care that that Muslim dome of the rock square box of Satanism sits where the temple's supposed to go. God's going to bring that sucker slap to the ground and that temple is going right back where God said he was going to go back and there ain't a Muslim this side of hell that can stop it. Somebody shout amen. We ain't give Twitter a run for a while. I'm just being calm and reserved how I say it. But don't you think for one minute that just because we're getting a little sweeter, I'm going to get less intense. We get through these uh, 17 principles here in a few minutes, and we'll know what intense is, and it won't be in this one. Anybody good? Jesus said, I don't care about your building. It's coming down. So it did. So then he's going to change gears. This is the law of double reference. He's talking about, first of all, the destruction of Jerusalem. Now he's going to talk about the destruction of the earth. We know that because verse 3 is very plain. He sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him. Notice this. The disciples came unto him privately. This was not for public consumption. We make it now for public consumption because it's the word of God. But this was for the disciples. They came unto him privately. Privately. <laughs> Whew, man, help me, Lord. I just keep seeing stuff I didn't see this morning. Listen, if you want real revelation, you ain't going to get it from the pulpit. You're going to get it privately from the Holy Ghost. I'll give you what God gives me, but if you're going to get something from God, you better go privately. And thou, Father, which seeth thee in secret, shall reward thee openly. Whew. Tell us, when shall these things be? Now watch this. Two different references. One of them was AD 70. It took place. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. Do not let that scare you. And he's going to say in just a moment, don't be afraid of these things. Did you know that second coming slash rapture fear is a real thing? There are people that fear the end days. You don't need to. When I see everything being prophetically fulfilled right now in the nation of Israel, I don't sit around chewing my fingernails to the quick with basketball-sized ulcers and say, Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm like, Whoo! Lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws nigh. It's happening just like God said it was. Every jot, every tittle. He's crossed every T, dotted every I, and still spelled the word right. I get excited when I see these things coming to pass. So he says, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Please notice, take heed that no man deceive you. Now let me stop and come down for a moment amongst you so I can explain something to you. I find it interesting that Jesus says what you need to look for first as a sign of his coming is the fact that you do not need to be deceived. You know why? Because we are already deeply into what we refer to in 2 Thessalonians, the last day's deception. Deception's here. People in the church world have fallen for it. Fallen for major deception. And I'm not just talking about churches flying rainbow flags. That, that's part of the deception. And it's interesting that it's part of the deception because if you go back into the revival meeting that we had for 22 nights and you listen to the message that I preach on the Antichrist, I'm convinced the reason now that the alphabet cult and the LGBTQIABCD agenda is so big is because the Antichrist, according to the Bible, is not going to have the desire of a woman. He's going to be a public sodomite. 
I, I use Bible words. Sodomite is a Bible word. Okay? So he said, don't be deceived. The first thing he said, he could have said a thousand things. He said, no, no, let me tell you the first thing you should not do when the end time comes upon you. Don't be deceived. What a spirit of deception. What a spirit of deception. The spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the age is upon us. I mean, I, I don't even recognize social media anymore. People all over the world, and sadly, probably some people in this room believe everything they read on the internet. They get their theology from the internet. They get their, their, their devotional time from the internet. And I get it. The internet can be used for a lot of good things, but you believe everything in the world. Did you know that the Pentagon finally released the papers that there are extraterrestrial beings? Yeah, we call them demons. They've been around for a long time. E.T. phone home, my hind leg. It's demons. Man, I, I know people that they would love more than anything in the world to be well-versed in QAnon conspiracy theories and ignorant of the Bible. I figured I'd get about four amens on that. We got wrapped up in some of that crap, too. We don't apologize for it. Okay? Everybody all right? I guess I'll just go ahead and thin the ranks out before conference gets here so we have enough seats for everybody. Some of y'all defend stupid stuff more than you defend the Bible. Crazy stuff. You don't believe me? Find somebody in the church that's reading Twilight or Harry Potter. Tell them to put it down because it's witchcraft and see if they don't defend Twilight and Harry Potter more than they will the Bible. Hmm? People get mad about that kind of stuff. Well, you just ain't got no right to say these things. Well, Jesus gave me a right because he said in the last days, take heed that no man deceive you. And by the way, he was talking to the disciples. If shepherds can be deceived, no wonder the sheep are in a mess. These lying shepherds that won't tell the truth because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. They're afraid people are going to leave the church and they're going to lose their tithe money. Who cares about all that stuff? It's all going to burn up. So he said, first thing you need to recognize is the fact that you better not be deceived. Why? All right, verse 5, I'll tell you why. For many shout many. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. People look at that and are like, well, that's not happening. Did you know there are more people on planet Earth right now collectively that claim to be the Messiah than at any other time in the history of the world? And people believe them. Look, I want you to believe me when I say stuff. If I ever get up and tell you I am Jesus, I am God, or I am the Messiah, you better tar and feather me and run me out of town or you ain't learned nothing about that Bible in your lap. I mean, there are more people today that are claiming to be Jesus, claiming to be the Messiah, claiming all of these things. And God said in the last days that was going to accentuate. It wasn't going to lessen. It was going to lengthen. It was going to get bigger and longer and greater and more powerful and more expansive. People are going to literally be saying, I'm Jesus. I'm God. It's what God told. I get all the time. I get people that message me. I am a messenger of the Lord. And the Lord specifically told me, yada, 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 shmada. I've had them stand right here in the meet and greet line, look me in the eye and ask me to call them Jesus Christ. Help me, Holy Ghost, if I'm lying. Now, then, longer, no longer go here. Because that wasn't the, the coming of Christ. That was the going of Christ because I kicked him out for being a heretic. But the Bible says, and shall deceive many. Now, wait just a minute. He just got through saying that it's going to be a time when they need to take heed as leaders because many of them shall be deceived. Now, when the leaders are getting deceived, don't you think the people are getting deceived? Holy smokes, if we needed ever, ever some biblical discernment these days, it is right now the day and age in which we live. Everybody with straight teeth, a bad toupee, and a Bible under their arm has not been called by the Holy Ghost just because they got a blue check mark by their name. He said in verse 6, we can, so much more to that, but he said, and ye shall, I love this, I like how he words this. It's amazing how I, I've read this for so many years, but I never noticed the, the juicy details. He said, watch this. That there shall, ye shall hear of wars. Did you know there's war happening right now all over the world? 
War, 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 war. And in an issue of who's in office, who's out of office, war is man's nature. And so he said in the last days, you're going to hear of wars. Now watch this. I have this underlined. And rumors of wars. You know why that's so applicable? Because that's what's happening right now in the Ukraine. Bunch of lying devils. It's a rumor of a war. They're partying in the streets right now while we're sending them billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. And people on Facebook are like, oh, those poor, beat down, oppressed Ukrainians. I think I'll change my Facebook status profile to a Ukrainian flag. You ought to read a Bible and quit being so spiritually naive and immature is what you ought to do. It's a rumor of a war. It is fake. It is green screen. It is optics. It's optics. If they can steal an election before your very eyes, then don't you think they can fake a war? That's not political. That is the moral decay of a society that we are living in. And people sit around like, well, you know, I, I don't care what you think you know. Google has lied to you. Have you seen what's happening with AI right now? Wake up, church. Have you seen the deep fake videos of people that look and act and respond just like a, you would swear they are so real. They're fake. Why do you think Hollywood's striking right now? Because they're not making enough money? No, it has nothing to do with money. You know why Hollywood's striking? Because AI is about to put actors out of business. You ain't got to pay a computer to look as good as Tom Cruise does. Right? You, you don't have to pay people millions of dollars. Just computer generate them and AI will do the work. That's why they're striking. Look, even the world's figuring out that the Antichrist system is already upon us and the church sitting around with their thumb and their nose wondering what's going on. Preacher, oh, no, preach like that. Come on, find me another church. That's all right. When Antichrist shows up, you'll show back up at this one because we'll be the one that feeds you and houses you and clothes you. You'll be back. All these people talking smack online used to go here. We know the truth about them people. Number one, you ain't never told it because you don't know no truth. And number two, when hell breaks loose, you're going to come back licking your wounds and asking us to forgive you because ain't no other church going to be feeding you, housing you, clothing you, giving milk to your babies and diapers on your baby's bottoms. You'll come crawling back. Guess what? We'll take every last one of you. We'll love you in the name of the Lord. You just won't ever get a microphone again, I guarantee you that. So notice it says wars and rumors of war, right? So apparently in the last days, there's going to be rumors of war. Okay, there's rumors of war. Rumors. Rumors. Rumors are like tumors. Undealt with, they grow and get bigger. Malignant. That was good, wasn't it? My wife said, wow, that was good. I just thought about that. That was pretty good. Put that on a shirt, praise God. Rumors are like tumors. Now, I love the next phrase. See that you be not troubled. Isn't that beautiful? Everybody's like, huh, huh, huh. God said, oh, no, buck up. It's good. It's a ride right here. Look, I'm, I'm terrified of very few things in life, but let me just share a pastoral secret with you. One of the things I can't stand, maybe I need deliverance, is roller coasters. I used to be terrified of spiders, have arachnophobia. I could pet one now and be fine, but I get on a roller coaster. Did you know that I would never go bungee jumping, but I would jump off the same bridge into the water with nothing strapped to me? It's that coming back up moment that I don't want. I would jump into an airbag off 300 feet, but I would never jump off of 100 feet with something strapped to my ankles or strapped around my waist, right? Just wouldn't. But you better know something. We are on a... We about to go over the edge. So right about now, we about right at the last tick at the top, and we looking over thinking, mm, did I really sign up for this? Yep, but you riding whether you signed up or not. This is a forced roller coaster ride, but you know what God says? Don't even let it sweat. Don't let it bother you. 
Do not be afraid. Do not be troubled. And yet the world is crippled by fear and trouble. The church is crippled by fear and trouble. When's Jesus going to come? What are we going to do? I'm going to feed my kids. What about the mark of the beast? What about that woman in the UK that thought it was wonderful to pay for her groceries with her hands? You won't think that's so cool pretty soon. And everybody's like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? You're talking about AI. You're talking about wars and rumors of wars. You're talking about Russia and Ukraine and America and China. Oh, what are we going to do? We are going to enjoy the ride. Stop all this stuff. I wish I'd have been raised 100 years ago. Oh, no, no, no. We're right in the thick of it. This is the best battle you could have been born into. You were equipped for this. You came to the kingdom for such a time as this. Quit bemoaning that fact, trying to live in the future and live in the past. I want to live right now in the nasty now and now. I want to look the Antichrist square in the face, spit in his face, and let him cut my head off for the glory of God because God's going to put a crown on it. And they shall cast their crowns at the feet of the Lamb and say, Thou art worthy. He that redeemed us back to God again. I say to the devil every demon in hell and to the end of Christ bring it on bring it on bring it on yes mash the gas when he sets up his little kingdom and he tries to take over the world ain't gonna be no I told you so tweets I'm just going for it. You think I'm wild now? Whew. They'll be sending the National Guard in here then. Well, it'll be the United Guard. It'll be one world government then. But I'm going to keep talking a little bit. I should have wore a t-shirt today. I might feel like I've been in that baptistry. So, uh, j- just in case you see stupid stuff in the news, uh, so we're under scrutiny again for our tent, right? So all this is public record so I can say it without being stupid. The attorney, let me get this right, the attorney for the county is losing, uh, and he knows he will. There was just a case very similar to this that went to the Supreme Court and they won, so they're a little nervous about churches right now because we're going to win. I don't care what they say. So their attorney felt the heat. So their attorney called the state fire marshal, who's already been here, by the way, like three times for inspections. We've done doors, exit signs, you know, everything, fire extinguishers, whatever we needed to do to be in compliance. We made sure we had to send them the specs on the walls for the sound, which we didn't have to do, that were being, how deep they were, how tall they were, how wide, the whole, I mean, we have passed everything just fine. So the other morning, that attorney calls the state fire marshal to come over here for an impromptu inspection of the tent at 6 30 in the morning when they knew no one would be here and now the state fire marshal they're like oh nobody would allow us access we're gonna find you we're gonna send an injunction let me tell you something we may not be in the days of covid but covid gave them an excuse to be bullies and act like that to the church in this nation so i don't have to rewind and go back into all that But let me just beg you to understand the words that shall come forth from my fatherly mouth. There is not one government official on the planet. There's not one woke pastor in the universe. There's not one Democrat or Republican or Independent. There's not one president. There's not one IRS agent. There's not one FBI agent. There's not a National Guard. There's not a United Guard. That is ever, shout ever, going to shut down the services of this church because they do not like what we are doing. They're not. I don't care how many fines they give us, how many injunctions. We have jumped through more hoops than a circus monkey. So they can keep the circus. We're going to keep the tent. Because this ain't no circus. Okay? So... I measure my words, taking my time. Some of y'all look like you stepped in something in the parking lot. You're like, I preach slow to give you time to leave if you need to. Okay? For all these things must come to pass. See there? Why are you so worried about it? 
Why are we fretting about it? He said it's going to happen. These things, he, he doesn't say that they maybe should, could, no, no. He said they shall, they are, they have to come to pass for the end to come. These things have to happen. God is not going to prophetically change his mind to rescue you. Did you hear me? These things have to happen. What things? Well, he's only mentioned a couple of them. He's got a whole lot more that we don't have time to develop. But he said, look, don't worry about what is going to come to pass because it has to. But the end is not yet. Watch this verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation. Is that not happening right now? Nations are in a bloodbath right now. Nations rising against nation. Nation rising against nation. It's the fulfillment of the wars and the rumors of wars. Nations are never going to get along. There is no such thing as a true united nations. They're not united about anything. They can't even get along. They can't even figure out, you know, the color of a sidewalk or who can chew gum and who can't chew gum. Who's this? Who's that? These people are completely, absolutely mindless individuals that have nothing but the influence of a demonic principality over them. And I'm telling you, nations will never be at peace until the Prince of Peace shows up. Never. There's always going to be war. But pray tell me why the next part of this text never moved me the way it did early this morning in my office. Nation shall rise against nation. Now watch this. And kingdom. Yeah. yeah you can tell we're a deliverance church. Against kingdom. I'd never seen that. I'm just telling you that God's on his path. I'd never seen that till this morning. I've always said, yep, those nations, those kingdoms of the world, they're going to fight. There's only two kingdoms. And one of the principles of the last day is that the kingdom of darkness is going to put its warrior boots on. And it's going to get bigger and bolder and better and badder. And it's going to start coming and coming and coming and coming. But when it comes, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment, God will snatch it out, throw it to the ground. You dig a hole for me, you'll fall in it. You roll a rock against me, it'll roll back on you. And the Bible says in the last day, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness are both going to rise before everybody's eyes. Kingdom shall rise against kingdom. That's why deliverance ministry is going to be so important. Have you noticed that in the last year there have been at least 30 movies come out on both sides about demons? Why is everybody so infatuated with demons? Because in the last days, kingdom... He's going to rise up against kingdom. It's coming. It's here. It's happening. People are like, my goodness, why is the culture getting crazier? It's compounded interest. Jesus said they're going to come back seven times worse. Remember that principle that we preached on? We clarified what it really meant in the Bible. What does he mean? So shall it be in this evil and wicked generation. It means that because nobody does anything about it, this generation and the next generation and the next generation, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. worse. Because in the last days, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. They shall leave the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And nation will rise against nation, but God's kingdom will rise against the devil's kingdom as well. So in the last days, we will see an increase in demonic activity and an increase in miracles, signs, and wonders, and deliverance. That's the facts. There's no way around that. You can't have one without the other. Am I making sense? Whoo! Kingdom against kingdom. I never saw that till today. That ain't no earthly kingdom. That's some supernatural, otherworldly stuff. And if you knew what was going on behind the veil in this tent right now, it'd flip you out. And if you want to see some of it come tonight to the 82nd week of mass deliverance, and you're going to hear demons come out in Jesus' mighty name. Because when the devil puts up a fight, we put on the armor of God and take the fight right to him. Don't be afraid. Don't you be scared. I'm so secure in my Jesus, I can swing over hell on a rotten corn stalk, spit the devil in the eye and sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Woo! I want to be so full of God. When a mosquito bites me, he flies away singing power in the blood. I ain't going back to boring Christianity. Y'all can have it, but you won't have it around here. Kingdom rising against kingdom. And notice, there shall be famines. 
Isn't that crazy? We waste more at McDonald's. Not me, I don't eat that garbage. But I used to eat a lot of McDonald's and I got arches in my back. Just kidding. But uh, 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 it's a dad joke. We waste so much money on fast food when there are people literally around the world at more time, that, at, there's more people now at any other time in the history of humanity that are starving to death. You know what's, what, now our church has done a lot of boots on the ground with this in the past because our public school system's in a mess right now. But did you know in Wilson County, Wilson County, there are kids that are so hungry in our back door go to our public schools hungry like like starving i still can't figure out why public schools even charge them for a lunch but whatever we'll, we'll we'll pay all the lunches off if we have to i don't care how much money it costs i mean so we think about oh, those people over in uganda people in zimbabwe people in tanzania starving to death people in nashville starving homelessness is an epidemic starvation is an epidemic the bible says it's going to be famine now, by the way, I find it interesting. He does not tell us if the famine is only going to be natural. No, no, no. I believe in the last days the famine will be natural and will be man-made. It will be man-made. If you don't think they're trying to kill us with the food that we are eating and then destroy the good food that won't kill us, you are not paying attention. And that is not a conspiracy theory. That is the absolute 1,000% facts. The biggest lie you've ever heard in your life is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. They're not. They're not. But anyhow, there's going to be famines. People are going to be starving. Pestilences. Diseases. Hmm. Someone might walk out of a lab on somebody's shoe in Wuhan, China. But it's still a pestilence. You see, it's interesting. He does not ever tell us if it's going to be natural or man-made forced upon us. It's going to be both. You see, you start manipulating DNA structures. You, you, you start splitting genes and you start, you know, mutating. Listen, you're going to get a monster. Frankenstein been trying to tell us something for a long time. You start taking two things that ain't supposed to be together and you start mutating them, splicing them, and putting them together, you're going to end up with a mess on your hand. You're going to have a pestilence that you can't handle. And it's what's happening. Then he says earthquakes, more earthquakes right now happening while I'm preaching than any other time in the history of the world in divers' places. That doesn't mean divers like underwater, although many of them are happening underwater right this very moment. It means in various places. It's happening, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. You know what we found out about the ocean? We figured this out before we went there. I wouldn't have believed it until I stood in it. I'm usually a sissy when it comes to ocean water. I don't like nothing cold touching me. All right? So I'm like easing out into the water. I got my dad's shirt on, you know, and I'm like, woo, it's so cold. No, no. The ocean is like a bath. I'm like, oh, what? Let's have a baptismal celebration right up in here. It's like warm. So then we start figuring out that the ocean temperatures around the world are at an all-time zenith point right now. Hotter than they've ever been. And it ain't because of global warming. It's because of God's warning. I like it when them t-shirts roll out of me and I don't even mean for them to. It ain't global warming. It's God's warnings what it is. <laughs> them weight, them swells, bigger than I've ever seen them. Them kids on them, them little skinny board things, woo, they having a good time. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, the whole world right now is like groaning. It's groaning. Maui's on fire, folks. The epicenter of the beauty of tourism and historicity in this nation. Burned up. Man-made or natural, don't matter. It's gone. You can't get it back. People being displaced all over the world. Earthquakes. We have not seen the likeness of fires as we're going to see in this nation burning from coast to coast. 
And I'm not prophetically wishing for it. I'm prophetically warning you and telling you it's going to happen. Temperatures are going to change like never before. Pestilence is coming. Disease is coming. Earthquakes are coming. And you're like, what do we do? God said, don't even worry about it. He's going to protect us. He's going to put us in a Holy Ghost bubble and protect us. He's going to feed us. He's going to give us the Joseph principle that we can put back and put up and store away for when the famine comes. And when the famine comes, the whole world will be coming to the place that was ready for the famine. You see, the last day's revival will be propelled by the last day's judgments. Because those hiding from the judgment will come to the house of revival and they'll find a place of mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Isn't that a beautiful thing? All these, check this out, verse 8, are the beginning of sorrows. Meaning by that, the end is nowhere near at this point. This is just the starting point. This is just the introduction to the book. This is just the, this is not the conclusion. This is not the climactic analogy and illustration of the book. No, this isn't even chapter 1. This is like the introduction. These are the beginning of sorrows. These are the birthing pains. This is the, whoo, we're in labor. We're about to give forth birth, but the water ain't even broke yet. But you'll know when the water breaks. Can you better know when the water breaks, God's about to give birth to some stuff in this world. And it's about to happen. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. And notice, when these days are upon us, what's going to happen? Then. Shout then. then. That means then during that time. When all this is happening, just at the beginning. Not, see, that's why I don't care if you think middle, beginning, end. No, no, no. That's why at the very beginning of all of it, before any of it happens, this is, gonna have, this is just the beginning. This is just the starting point. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Now, I know some of y'all think that's King James fantasticalism. That's prophetic realism. You see... What 2020 taught us was this. We never could imagine that friends and family in our lifetime would ever turn on someone and be willing for them to be prosecuted and even wish death upon them until COVID happened. And we look at this and we're like, you mean in the last days, people are going to betray each other and give each uh, up each other to death? Yeah. You see, I don't believe it. People wish death on you for not wearing a mask in Walmart. And you're going to think when they can't feed their kids and their family, they're not going to wish death on you. They're going to turn you in quick. They will turn you in. There are so many traitors in Christianity. The longer I preach, the more I'm convinced there are more Judases than there are the other 11 disciples. That's a fact. And there's at least one in every 12. <laughs> That's a good statistical data right there. People will just, they'll sell you out. You think, oh, no, no. Are you kidding me? They unfriended you on Facebook just because you said one little thing they didn't like. I never saw that coming. I did. I did. And sometimes I've been a little bit too patient with the people that I saw it coming from. If I'd have listened to my wife the first time she told me that person was a church troublemaker, I wouldn't have had to repent before the Holy Spirit said, wow, Holy Spirit, I should have listened to Ty to begin with. Now, I ain't naming no names because hopefully ain't nobody in the room still, but she ain't never been wrong about a church troublemaker. I can guarantee you that. If my wife tells me that woman's after you, if my wife tells me that woman's got eyes for you, if my wife tells me that man's going to be a problem, if my wife tells me that person right there is coming against the ministry, they're going to harm us, they're going to hurt us, they got a spirit of divination, I can promise you 1,000 and 1,000% 1, of the time she's been right every single time. It's the fact. So there are so many people that they'll sell you out for a bowl of rice. You wait. I'm telling you, you better figure out who your real friends are. I'm, I'm telling you, people will sell you out. And by the way, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes. I, I probably won't even get to my principles. Whew, I could ring that out right now. You know, we get people that come here all the time. 
with a false motivation with an idea that they're going to destroy us before they ever even meet us as your shepherd I love you enough to tell you yes we help broken people we, we help all sorts of people but some of y'all and I'm going to say it this way reverently so you understand it. Some of y'all need to quit trying to pick up every stray dog that comes into this parking lot. You, you hear me? These per people, are, we get a lot of people that come here that have no plans. We, we'll help people as much as we can. We get a lot of people more than we should that come here with a nefarious plan from the, from the rib. And some of y'all, same ones, drag them up to me. And I know why they're here. And they can't figure out why I won't house them, why I won't clothe them, why I won't feed them, why I won't coddle them, why I won't give them another check because I've done given three. I'm telling you, there are people that come here for the wrong reason. And by the way, when I, after the fact, find out that when they showed up, they had a camera in hand down beside them because they were trying to set us up from the get-go. I knew my recollection and Holy Spirit premonition was correct to begin. I should have just dealt with it then. Everybody okay? Everybody that just shows up here and calls themselves a prophet is not from God. You understand that? Get you some biblical discernment. Because some of you are going to open your house up to people that are going to rob from you. And I love you enough to tell you that. Now look, there's, there's people that legitimately need help. And God will sort it out and God will tell us who they are. But some of y'all got this, this stray animal mentality. And I know it's because you have a high end gift of mercy. I do too. That's why I put up with these stupid people. Longer than I should. But some of y'all, maybe some of y'all right now, you got them living in your house and they're not even at church. You know why they ain't at church? Because when you get home, you're going to be robbed. Your big screen TV going to be gone. Y'all okay? And y'all want to run them up to me in a meet and greet line. These people escaped wildfires in Canada. They need help. These people showed up at my house unannounced with a camera in hand to put us on YouTube and falsify information about me and my wife and you're going to patty cake up with them and think everything's all good in the hood just because they're running from some wildfires. As far as I'm concerned, they can go right on back to their wildfires because they ain't starting one down here at Global Vision Bible Church trying to accuse us of a bunch of nonsense. And if them people still in your house, I promise you, hand to God, they will rob you blind before you get home. If you don't get up and run home right now, they're stealing everything you got and you're naive enough to believe it and get mad at me when I say something about it. Look, we have hundreds of people that come here through the months and sleep in our parking lot. That's fine. I don't mind it one bit. But we got our limitations. Stop dragging in people up to me in a meet and greet line like I'm supposed to house them and help them and I'm supposed to be the Savior and the Messiah. They come here from Timbuktu, Thailand, ain't even got a plan. Some of them got a real plan and the plan is to destroy us before they ever get here and I ain't putting up with none of them no more. No more. I'll call them out from the platform. I don't care how mean and mad that makes me look. Stop trying to fix all these wounded animals. You know what a wounded animal do? You back in the corner, it'll bite your arm off. It's telling you. The church in America is full of Judas Iscariots. The pulpits are full of Judas Iscariots. Full of it. And he said, people are going to hate you. People are going to want to kill you. Look, whenever he comes... And my daughter's big on this. We talk about it all the time. But whenever he does or doesn't come, I'm here to tell you, if we live this thing out, some of us in this room and some of us watching online are going to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you the facts. I know y'all think that's all medieval stuff. No, there are people in China right now dying for their faith. Why are you better than them? There are people in Saudi Arabia getting burned and drowned for their faith in Jesus. Why do you think you're better than him? Because you've got some Americanized mentality of some hippie white Jesus you serve. 
Your hippie white Jesus ain't going to save you from the persecution they show. You better get a picture of what Jesus really looks like in the Bible and recognize the fact that persecution is coming to the church. Persecution's coming to the church. We got such a falsified idea of what's happening all around us. It don't even bother us. People going to kill us. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. If you have to always be liked, Jesus is talking about you. Jesus is talking about you. Oh, I got to quit. And then, shall many be offended? I'm glad he put that in there. Because some of y'all had to take a deep breath this morning. <laughs> Don't live with a spirit of offense. If you can't handle this little bit of just tiny discourse, <laughs> when the tanks roll up, you're going to give in. No wonder you ran around wearing a mask for three years. Oh, I paid for groceries with my hand. This is so amazing. That's the mark of the beast. And God says, once you take it, you are damned to hell forever. And y'all want to play patty cakes with the pastor. Well, you know, you just, you're just a little bit too abrasive. We got to fly a rainbow flag outside and let us know that we're a gay, inclusive church. We're a God-inclusive church. So I, I, I'm, I'm done with this whole tickle me Elmo lukewarm Christianity business in this nation. It's sickening. If you think it makes us sick, you know it makes God sick. Verse 10. And then, shall they be offended? Shall betray one another? Yep. Shall hate one another? Yep. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Whoa. Shout many. Notice there's two many's. Many false prophets shall deceive many. It takes many to reach many or to deceive many. Does that make sense? It's mathematics. Now listen. The underpinning of being a false prophet is not what somebody says about them on YouTube or Facebook. The underpinning foundationally, theologically, and fundamentally of a false prophet is, Matthew 7, by their fruit ye shall know them. So sometimes it can look like unity and alignment in the body of Christ, with some of my friends, can seem like compromise. Understand something about Greg Locke. Understand something. I'm loyal to a fault I'm merciful to a fault if you're teachable I'll help you if you're repentive and respectable I'll respect you I'll hold hands with you I'll preach on the same platform and big conferences with you I'll publicly tell people we're friends I'll mention your name I'll pray for you I'll love you but the second, you theologically cross and kick down the guardrails of God's Word. And your fruits show you to be a false prophet. My loyalty to Jesus will be stronger than my loyalty to you and your internet platform. So don't think I'm aloof and ignorant as to the reality of what's happening. Sometimes you just have to amalgamate yourself right in the middle of the garden to see how the fruit's going to pop up. So I'm not called to be a prophetic judge. I'm called to be a prophetic fruit inspector. Because according to the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, only prophets get the privilege of judging prophets. So if somebody's a real prophet, but you a punk on the internet, I'm just going to go backstage. Huh? So if somebody's a real prophet, and I'm not saying where they are or not, but all you got is a YouTube video 10 seconds out of context and out of a, some little clip that you like. Because, you know, somebody shared it with you. With no beginning and no ending, just a little middle. 
And I know we gave a little context from the middle. No, 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 you better get the whole meat and potatoes. Don't just pull the backbone out. You got to get the skin, right? So look, there's a lot of people out there, everybody, wolf this, wolf this. Isaiah's a wolf. Greg Locke's a wolf. Pagani's a wolf. Signorelli's a wolf. Then, you know, this, this person's a wolf. You know, Prophet Lovey is a wolf. And, you know, whoever, whoever, you, you name it. Jenny Weaver, I hear all the time, Jenny Weaver is a witch. If Jenny Weaver's a witch, I'm a Japanese navigator. If Alexander Pagani is a witch doctor, holy smoke, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I hear all kinds of, this person's a wolf, this person's a wolf. What about this person? What about Brian Trejo? He's a wolf, he's a wolf, he's a wolf, he's a wolf, he's a wolf. You know what you sound like when you type woof, 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 woof? You sound like a dog. When it's time to call out a wolf, we call out a wolf. But if all you ever do is woof, 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 guess who the wolf is? Hmm? You see, wolves run in packs. They wolf each other. They protect each other. Sheep don't run in packs. They run in herds. And without a shepherd, they run off the cliff. So let me tell you what happens oftentimes. We see these internet, and I'm just, I'm just pastoring our people today. We see these internet famous people whether we got them coming to the conference or not, there's not justification for that. And, and if you're not careful, you would immediately begin to judge in the flesh based off something that you heard, that you've seen, that maybe even you experienced in some small way. But there's only one way to prove the reality of a false and true prophet. Their fruit will speak for itself. If they bear bad, wicked, adulterous, godless, no Holy Ghost fruit, they're false. If they bear deception, they're false. But if they bear people getting saved, converts being baptized, diseases being healed, baptism of the Holy Spirit, miracle signs and wonders, deliverance happening, because the devil ain't casting out the devil. And Jesus said that himself in Matthew chapter number 12. You have to judge them by their fruits. Otherwise, you will end up having a page like mine. Did you know I have more people blocked on Pastor Greg Locke's verified blue check mark ministry page? I have more people blocked than 95% of the people in the world with the biggest Facebook pages. I have over 400,000 people blocked on my page. Think about that. So I can go on vacation and I can put a picture of me and my wife. I can go on vacation and I can put a picture of me and my kids. I can go put a picture of Gampa pushing little man. And the haters... I'm, I'm, I'm walking around in a hat and sunglasses, pushing my grandkids, trying not to get recognized in Florida. And I got people online saying, oh, look at that false prophet. Look at that false prophet. Look at that false prophet. Look at that false, he's worth $129 million. How many mansions you got? How many Lear jets you got? I'm like, bro, I got a foldable stroller that costs like $15 on Amazon. $25 sunglasses. I got on black socks with white shoes. But I'm a false prophet. No, no, no. I'm going to be a false fashionista. <sighs> you good? <laughs> All right. Anyhow, we got to quit. I promise we got to quit. Whew. This is fun, though. I like the Bible. Many false prophets arise, deceive many, verse 12. And because, okay, because of what? Because iniquity shall abound. Have you not seen iniquity abound? <laughs> what iniquitous days we are living in. And because it abounds. Now look, this is the reason for what comes next. This is cause and effect verse. Here's the cause, here's the effect. And because iniquity shall abound. Here's the effect. The love of many. 
the love of many. That's the love of many people that claim to be believers and followers of Jesus. The love of many shall wax cold. So in the last days, because iniquity shall abound so much, people want to identify with the iniquity rather than being identified with those that offend those that are involved in the iniquity. And because of that, their love, like a candle, waxes cold. And you know what happens when a candle burns out? The wax gets hard. And the American, and shall I dare say, the global church all over the world has become hardened to the things of God because iniquity is everywhere. It's in every corner of the nation. And we would rather fit in with iniquity than stand out and be offensive. So much could be said there. But he that shall, and I find this word intriguing, endure. Why we got 51 verses on spiritual endurance to an event that the people that are supposed to endure apparently aren't even going to be here. Well, it ain't the world doing the endurance. It ain't like the Sodomites are trying to survive the culture. They're creating the culture. Right? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. It's not a work salvation. It's a salvation that works. They endure because they were saved. They fought because they were saved, not to attain it, but because they already apprehended it. So I don't think we'll be able to go any further. We'll, we'll, we, we'll maybe pick up Matthew chapter 24. There's so much here. Whew. So much here. I'm not even going to make any references to what I'm about to read you. I'm going to read it. She's going to pray. We're going to have baptismal celebrations. And we're going to let the Lord just prepare our hearts and break us free. But I feel like I'd do you an injustice if I, if I didn't just at least. Can I just read it? It's 1249. I will be done in just a second. All of these could be preached on. Maybe we'll break them down on a Wednesday night. This this be 17 Wednesday nights. But I'm going to tell you where this came from the other day. It came from a... a an amazing post. Where's uh, Latoya at? Latoya's right here somewhere. She had a post and she was talking about the, the shifting that's happening. And there is a shift. And I responded back and I said, oh, yes, I agree. The shifting is a sifting. You see, when God shifts stuff, he shakes stuff. And so some people are going to fall out in the sifting process. The noodles are getting thrown in the strainer. And something going to strain plumb out. Okay, so not everybody's going to make it. I'm talking about people that go to church, people that walk an aisle, sign a card, pray a prayer, get in the baptismal dunking tank, go through deliverance. Sometimes real good, well-meaning people. People that endured for a while. So I wrote these things down in regards to just where I'm at in my Bible study this morning, and I'm only going to read them to you, I promise. Only going to read them to you. So the best thing y'all can do is not respond when I read each one of them, because if you start responding, I'm going to go all, like, <laughs> preaching on you. Okay, so because the shifting is coming, here's how, I've, here's how I've titled this. Those who won't survive the sifting. Okay, the shifting is going to happen whether you want it or not, but the shifting is going to move to a sifting process. People are going to be sifted out, out of church, out, out of marriages, out of homes, out of the nation, out of the world. Okay, people are going to separate the sheep from the goats. So if you're a believer, this is for you because you can be a believer and still exemplify some of these nonsensical things that I want to share with you, okay? Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll make this as, as a standalone Facebook post. I don't do a lot of writing posts, but maybe we'll do that with the team this week, okay? These are the people that will not make the shift because of the sift. These are the people in 10 years from right now, I'm prophes prophesying in 10 years from right now, these are the people that will not, that will not make it. They won't make it through any sort of tribulation, much less the tribulation. They won't make it for, for round two of COVID because it's coming. They, they won't make it. These people won't make it. Their homes won't make it. Their kids won't make it. Their marriages won't make it. Their churches sure won't make it. 17 people that will not survive the sifting. Number one, those who make excuses for being lukewarm. Mm. Number two, 
those who defend cultural evil. You're not going to make it. You're going to side with the Sodomites. Hmm? If you siding with them now, you wait till it gets worse. What I just said, within 10 years, I promise you, hand to God prophetically, before God strike me dead if it ain't true, in 10 years, what I just said will be a hate crime. If we even have 10. Number three, who won't survive the sifting? Those who resent the blessings of others. You ain't gonna make it. I see some of y'all on Facebook. I can't believe they got a new house. I can't believe they got a new car. I can't believe he's got a bigger church. I can't believe she got another hair color. I can't believe you so envious and showing the true heart of who you really are by not just rejoicing that somebody might just have something more than you do. Who cares? If you can't rejoice in the blessings of others, don't you ever pray another second for God to bless you because the first thing God will do in blessing you is give you a heart to be happy when other people get blessed. Number four, those who constantly whisper about other people. You ain't gonna make it. Just go ahead. You might as well quit whispering. You ain't gonna make it. You ain't gonna make it. Because you know what whisperers find out? They're being whispered about and they can't handle it. You see, weak people don't have the constitution on the inside of them to be able to handle being talked about because their whole life they've built themselves up by breaking everybody else down. Who won't survive the sifting? Number five, those who pretend to understand the Bible that they never read. Now, I got to say something about this one. I've had to, me and the Greenwells have had to deal with this online community people. Some of y'all need to quit quoting stuff from the Bible that your grandmama told you that's in the Webster's Dictionary that didn't come out of the Bible. Well, the Bible says that cleanliness is next to godliness. No, your grandmama told you that, but that ain't a proverb. That ain't a proverb. Okay? And we got a lot of mom and pop theology in the church world. And then people trying to tell me how to pastor a church that ain't never pastored an outhouse. That online crew, man, they, they all of them, they know about the Bible, but don't ever read it. I saw one of them the other day. Well, the Bible says, and it don't say nowhere even remotely, no such thing. So I'm going to tell you who ain't going to make it. The people who pretend to understand the Bible that they never read. If you don't ever read your Bible, do not talk to me about theology. I don't care what you believe because it ain't biblical if you don't read the Bible. You just ain't. I don't, I don't care. If, if you do not get in the context of the Word of God, the context of the Word of God does not get inside of you. And I don't care how smooth you are on Facebook. You're ignorant of the facts. Number six. Those who try to justify being stingy. Do you know why you're not going to... I'm talking. You know why you're not going to survive the sifting if you're a stingy person? Because you get back then what you put in now. You got to sow into the kingdom. You see, you always reap what you sow. You always reap more than you sow. But you'll never reap, reap a thing until you sow. So I'm like, well, I just can't give to the work of the Lord. I ain't got a lot of money. Well, you better give it away while you got some. Give God something to dig with. Stingy people will not make what's about to come to the church. Stingy people won't survive it. They, they will not survive it. Number seven, those who get bored with worship. You will not survive what's coming to America and to the world and to the church if you get bored with worship. If you're like, oh my goodness, another song, another hallelujah, another flag, my goodness. Why well, they got them orange flags? It's Tennessee, we want them to win. Just kidding. But at the end of the day, if worship, even in your car, bores you, now I get it if K Love bores you, I can't stand that station. But nonetheless, if worship bores you something's wrong <laughs> so like, I can't believe you said it about Caleb <laughs> I can't believe they didn't say anything about Roe v. Wade being overturned <laughs> number eight those who refuse to deal with unforgiveness you don't know what they did I don't care what they did it pales in comparison to what you did to Jesus and God forgave you for Jesus sake Ephesians 4.32 Number nine, those who are concerned with convenience but not conviction. If you go to church when it's convenient but not because it's your conviction, then when the shifting happens, you'll never go back to church again. 
If you give when it's easy, then when it gets hard and you're not giving anymore, you're going to be shifted out and sifted out. You, be, you, better, you better do what's right by conviction, not because of convenience. Because the days of convenience are long gone. Number 10. Who's not going to survive? Those who always have to be liked and accepted. Now, I'm not saying you got to walk around being mean, obnoxious, and have bad breath all the time. But if, if you have an affinity for everybody having to agree with you, like you, and accept you, you're already done. There's no reason for you to even come back unless you're going to grow. If you have to fit in with the culture, you're not going to make what's happening in the next year, two years, ten years, five years, six years, seven years. You're not going to make it. You can't. It's impossible. Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. If everybody likes our church, there's a problem with our church. Okay? Even turning a curve, trying to be merciful and gracious. Not everybody's going to like our church, and they should not. They should not. Number 11. <laughs> Who's not going to survive? Those who live to discover the failures of others. If your whole life is to scour the internet looking for trash on people, you're not going to make it. You know what motivates me? You know who studies my life more than anybody else? Haters. You know who watches my every move more than anybody else? People that got mad and left this church. They watch my every move just hoping to find something. Number one, that's a miserable way to live. Number two, that's going to come back on you. When you hope for the failure and the demise of others, Proverbs 24, 17 and 18 says that it's not going to turn out well for you. You'll be under the curse of the Lord. Number 12. <laughs> this is a big one. Those who have a fake social media life. You're not going to make the, the sift. You know why? Because what you put on Facebook is not how you live. I love your cute Instagram photos. But if you live by way of a Photoshop picture for the rest of your life when all hell breaks loose, your little Photoshop picture ain't going to help you. Your little perfect marriage, your little perfect kids that you had to half beat 57 times to even give them, take one picture. Look at me, look at me. Hey, I got a grandkid. Toby, look. Toby, look. Toby, look. Toby. He's looking. Look. Take a picture. Take a picture. It took 75 times to get the kid to look at the camera and he was frowning when he did. But all oh, you got that one pic. If you live in the realm of social media unreality, when all hell breaks loose and everything hits the fan prophetically and proverbially, you better know you're not going to make it. If I pastored, and I'm talking about in-house and online, if I pastored the people that most people pretend to be on social media, we would never have problems in our church. Y'all sweet online. Everybody's godly online. But you're not going to make the shift in the sift if you have a fake personality life, no, social media life. Number 13, almost there. Those who fight against unity in the body of Christ. You see, the shifting and the sifting is going to bring people together. It's going to shake some people out, but it's going to bring the right alliances together. And if you're always fighting, because, again, false, 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 false. God will reveal, well, it's false. And when I need to, I will. And I will. And I broke off good friendships doing it. My loyalty is to Jesus in this Bible. If a man proves himself to be false, if a woman proves herself to be false, I'll call him that. And I'll deal with it at that moment. But if all you ever do is fight against unity in the body of Christ, if you do not want the body of Christ to be unified, you are not going to be able to survive what comes next because it's going to take unity. We're going to have to gather together. We're going to have to huddle in these masses to make sure we can survive it. Number 14, I mentioned this earlier. Those who believe everything they hear, they're not going to make it. Number 15, those who think God will change what he's already prophesied. I saw it just the other day on Facebook. Again, 
I, I said something about that girl doing that deal with her hand and said that's the precursor to the mark of the beast. And, and, and I know they were trying to be cute and I know they were trying to be all spiritual and theological. And they're like, oh, Lord, would you please send your spirit to intervene with what's happening? God is not going to stop what he has prophetically promised is going to happen. He's not. We'll be saved from the wrath of the Lamb, but we will not be saved from the wrath of humanity. Number 16. Those who will not survive the sifting. Those who live in secret sin. You, you better go ahead and deal with your porn addiction. You better go ahead and deal with your secret weed addiction. Your pill addiction. You better go ahead and get right about that side chick you got. About that side man you got that you flirting with at the water cooler at work. About them secret text messages you getting from somebody who ain't your spouse. If you're living in secret sin, you're not making the leap. You're not making the leap. You better get right with God right now. And then number 17, this is the best way to top this whole thing off. Those who will not survive the sifting, those who carry a spirit of offense. So if you're like really mad by what I just said, I was talking to you all 17 times. So I don't know. I'm that one in play. I don't even know where to quit anymore. God don't ever tell me where to start and where to stop. He just tells me what to say in the middle. <laughs> So that's a lot. It's 103. I ain't preached that long in a long time. I apologize. I'm just telling you. I'm sweating it in. <clears throat> just a lot there. It's a lot there. You know, Paul said, uh, Have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So look, we, we got to stand on what the book says. We're going to be humble about it. I get it. Y'all can handle it in house. So Y'all can handle a little liberation from the preacher. Y'all used to wait more than this. We got a whole new suit of clothes now. We're different. But I tell you these things because I love you. Because I love your kids. I love your grandkids. I love the hubs. I love everybody online, even the crazy people. This thing's this, this whole ball of wax spinning out of control, people. And if we can't handle the little bit of stuff that comes against us. That's why I don't mind it sometimes just being super hot in here. Sometimes we just need a little bit of inconvenience. To remind us that, hey, it's better than going to hell. And Revelation 21, 8 says the cowards are the first one to go. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, all liars. So look, I say with Paul, I'm not your enemy. I'm your shepherd. I'm your friend. Right? I'm a father of this house. I have a responsibility to tell you the truth of the Word of God at the expense and consequence of having the world hate me for it. But I have to. I have to. I've told you before, I'll tell you again, and I'm out. something about who I am something about the makeup something about the DNA structure the blood in my veins that makes me this way and I perhaps believe some of my grandfather is in me because of this as well I cannot know the truth and not tell it I can't can't know the truth and not tell it. And the truth is when Jesus comes again is of no issue. It's the fact that we must be prepared and we must be ready when he comes again. And some of you just need to come right now and get your heart ready for the return of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say two things and then we're going to get serious. First of all, my orange flags are not Tennessee Vols flags. I don't even think that's the right color orange. Hallelujah. They are actually sound the alarm flags because we, every flag that we use has meaning behind it. So we were just in here sounding the alarm for y'all today. 
Amen. Um, second, uh, the uh, were they Canadian people? Canadian people that came and videoed me in the driveway. Okay, first of all, whoever told them where I lived, you were wrong. Don't ever do that again. Don't ever do that again. I had my grandbaby. Y'all don't know me like that. He is not playing when he tells you I'm from the south side of the kingdom. He means that. <laughs> you don't know me that way. I had my grandbaby. We were having family day. Don't do that. Don't tell people where we live. This world hates us. You put my entire family in danger. And if I ever found out who you were, I would kick you out of this church myself. You don't get to put my kids in danger. You don't get to do that. Amen. Don't ever tell people where I live again. Hallelujah. All that to say, he was talking about it. And I was like, you better tell them not to be telling people where I live because I'm about to and you're, you'd be a little bit nicer than me. <laughs> sometimes he's the nice one and sometimes I'm the nice one. We compliment each other well, y'all. Um, listen, we were sitting at the beach. This is so crazy because I sent Cassandra this whole big thing. We didn't talk for like four days. She, she left me alone to be with my family and she sent me one text message and I sent her this whole book. What's crazy is, is that pastor and I have not even talked about this and I didn't know that he was preaching on this today because I thought he was going to preach on something else out of the book of John. So I was real confused when he said Matthew 24. I was like, what is this man doing? Hallelujah. But listen, there truly is, we are coming into days right now that the Lord is requiring consecration from his children. That is not a suggestion at this point. It is a requirement because only the glory of the Lord is going to keep you in the days that are to come. Because the Lord showed me some things sitting at that beach, which I don't feel freedom from the Lord to share with you right now, but he showed me some things sitting down at that beach. And I'm telling you that the only way that you are going to stay in the glory and the presence of the father is if you have consecrated yourself. If you are actually practicing his presence in the secret place of the most high, you see, we've been playing games with prayer for a long time. We feel like we can say these little, now I lay me down to sleep, or God fix my husband, God fix my kid. No, help me, Holy Ghost, fix me. Amen. Fix me. And so we're going into days, and I'm telling you this because I love you, that your prayer life is going to have to look different. It really is. It can no longer be about, God, what can you do for me? It has to be about, God, what can I do for you in these days that your will would come to pass in my life and in the lives of those around us? We have to get away from this mindset that God has not done enough for us already. Oh, no, God did enough for us when he paid in full on the cross what we could never do for ourselves. That was the moment that he did enough for us. He did enough when he slain the lamb before the foundation of the world. And so I love you enough to tell you that in these days, your prayer life is going to have to look different. And I'm going to, I'm going to share something with you. And I do this. I'll be careful how I say it because I love to pray and I love to pray corporately with all of you. But some of you have even taken notice that I don't pray as much at the end of service anymore because I feel like in some way I've became a crutch for you. I've became a stumbling block in your walk with the Lord because you just love to hear me pray. Yeah, but the Lord loves to hear you pray. He loves to hear you pray. And, and I just really feel like sometimes I come up here and I start praying and you stay in your seat when really you need to be here because you just want to hear my prayer. But man, the Lord wants to hear your prayer. The Lord wants to hear from you. Listen, I understand that corporate prayer is important, but that's why we have a Saturday night prayer. That's why we come here on Saturday nights and we fellowship. I said to myself yesterday, I said, I'm going to have to start coming back because nobody shows up. That's what I said to myself yesterday. But really, the only reason we stopped coming is because we couldn't pray because everybody wanted us to minister to them at Saturday night prayer night. We just want to pray, y'all. Which is amazing to me that you want me to get up here at the end of service and pray, but then you want to interrupt me when I'm in here praying just to the in the Holy Ghost by myself. Amen. 
right? It's so messed up and that's why I'm telling you this. I'm not rebuking you, but I'm rebuking you because our relationship with the Lord has to look differently than always allowing somebody else to lead us into the presence of God. That only the worship team at GV can lead me into the presence of God. Listen, there's some prophetic instrumental worship on YouTube that will take you straight into the presence of God without one word, without one word, because you see, it's a heart posture. And some of you struggle with the fact that you're like, you're always talking about the presence, but I don't feel the presence because your heart posture is not right. And if you want to have a good heart posture, then you're gonna have to do what it takes in these days, which is truly a place of full surrender. Not this half surrender that looks like surrender to everybody else, we're not full in God. It's not surrender. And so today, I'm gonna pray because I feel like it, because I rebuked you, amen. You get sweet and spicy today, I guess. I'm gonna pray, but listen, seriously, you guys gotta learn how to pray. You gotta pray. Let me say that again. You gotta pray. You need to pray. You need to pray for your food. You need to pray for your driving. Help me, Holy Ghost. I've seen some of y'all pull out of this parking lot. You need to pray for the way that you drive. You need to pray for your kids. You need to pray for your home, your job, your family, your marriage, the whole nine yards. But you know what you really need to pray for? A right heart posture. You see, it's not about what we pray. It's not about what we ask the Lord. It's the intent of our heart behind it because the heart is a wicked above all things, the Bible says. And so until you get that right, it's kind of hard to get anything else right. Amen. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that truly in these days that are to come, we are really going to find out who trusts you as Elohim, the one that sits on the throne. We're gonna really find out who trusts you as Jireh, their provider. Lord, we're truly gonna figure out in the days to come, have we just been playing church? Have we just been pretending or are we really in an intimate relationship with you that we truly know you? And Father, my prayer today over everyone under the sound of my voice is that God, they begin to take a journey to truly know you. Because without the knowledge of who you are, Lord, there is no endurance. See, it's only because of you, Lord. It's because of who you are. It's because of your name. It's because of what you have already done that we can endure till the end anyway. And so, Father, as we are moving on this roller coaster, as my husband said, where we're just looking over the edge and we know that we're about to drop, oh, Lord, may we mount up like wings, like eagles. Lord, that we truly will just wait on you in this place, that we won't get ahead of you, that we won't get behind you. Oh, no, Lord, that we will just wait on you right in this place, that we would be like the disciples that waited until they were endued from power on high because, oh, Lord, we're going to need power from on high. But, Lord, more than that, Father, we need a relationship with you where we're just walking in our, in our office buildings, we're driving in the car, we're walking around the, the backyard, and we just start having a conversation with you like you're right there because you're our best friend, because, oh God, you're right there and you're our friend. Jesus, the friend of sinners, the one who will never leave us and never forsake us. And Lord, as we are looking up, because we do discern the season, Lord, we do discern that our redemption is drawing nigh. May our heart posture be before you that we're gonna bring anybody and everybody with us when we come, Lord. That our focus has now shifted into the arena that when we look out at people, oh God, that we look past the demonization that is going on and we look in to see the soul that you want to save. 
Lord, where we truly begin to, to peer into the lives of people and we can look the enemy in the face and say, oh no, this one's getting snatched for the glory of God. Lord, when our lives don't so much look about us anymore, oh God, no, they look like you. They look like you. In the book of Corinthians, God, your, your word says that that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And where that freedom is, it's like a mirror, Lord. It conforms us more into your image. And so God, I ask in these hours, in these days, that more freedom would begin to flood the streets from nation to nation to nation to nation. That the spirit of the Lord would fall so mightily upon every nation of this earth, that freedom would begin to break out, that it would be as a mirror set before the people that they would conform to your image, oh God. Oh, Lord, in these days, may there be less of us and more of you. Lord, where your name is truly exalted above the nations. Lord, where your people begin to be still in your very presence and wait for your directive. Lord, where we wait to know if we're coming or if we're going and we don't just show up to do the same thing over and over and over again. Oh no, we showed up because we said this is a new season. This is a new season and in this new season, God, we just want to behold you to do something new. Would your glory come like never before, Lord? Would your glory begin to manifest itself to this lost and dying world? Lord, that your spirit would begin to manifest itself in the darkest places. People right now in their bedrooms contemplating suicide. Lord, would your spirit manifest right now in their lives, God. Lord, would your glory come upon them. The shalom peace of God be with you. Lord, people in their homes right now in the midst of brokenness, in the valley of life, oh God, would you just raise up that valley that they're in right now, God? Would you make yourself known to them, oh God, that they would know you and then to know you crucified, God. That people would truly begin to see the glory of who you are in this hour. That is why we ask for your glory, God. We ask for your glory so that all the world can see all the world can see just how good and how marvelous and how matchless your name truly is. And Lord, we thank you that we can rest in the one who became our peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Stand to your feet. If you're here today for a baptismal celebration, make your way over as some of these folks already are. To my right, your left. We'll get your name tag. we got little changing rooms, little stations over there. We'll get you a towel. And if you want to come up closer, I know it'll be on the big screens for our live stream audience as well. But if you want to come take some pictures and so on and so forth, they will be posted uh, on our community Facebook page for Global Vision. But if you want to come up here for those that are going to be baptized, if you need prayer, special prayer, then slip up here this morning. You don't have to wait till tonight. But speaking of tonight, week number 82 for Mass Deliverance, our deliverance and healing service. Do not miss out on what the Lord is doing. We start promptly at 6 o'clock. These reserved seats up here don't mean anything on Sunday night. Get as close as you can. We keep that session a lot smaller than a big service like this. And so we try to keep it down to about a few hundred people just because it can get kind of wild, wild west. And we want to be able to personally touch and work and anoint and love on people and counsel folks. So tonight, be here for week number 82 of Mass Deliverance. Again, let's move this side over here for our baptismal celebrations. I never say you are dismissed. I just say we love you and we will see you tonight at 6 o'clock for Mass Deliverance or we'll see you on Wednesday night. If you are coming tonight for Mass Deliverance, do not wait around for the meet and greet line, all right? We will have that tonight at 5.30. We'll line up down the aisle here and we'll do pictures and shake hands and hug necks and all of that. Please don't double dip. It makes for a very long afternoon. So if you are going to be here tonight, I will be doing a special meet and greet. My wife and I will be doing that tonight. And so please do not stand in the line this morning. But let's have some baptismal celebrations. If you're glad you came to church today, shout amen.